All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Judicial Proceedings Committee. Today is Tuesday, January 23rd, 2024. This is our uh, final presentation on our series of briefings on um, uh, the juvenile justice system and uh, crime trends and analysis, both in the adult and the juvenile system. Today, we are pleased to be joined uh, by the Council of State Governments, and they're going to brief us on trends on violent crime here in Maryland. Um, they've, uh, if you've done the, if you've looked at the read ahead, they've done prepared a fantastic presentation for us. They've taken a deep dive into some of the trends. Um, and then also uh, have a, are going to tell us about how some other jurisdictions have applied certain things to, under, to understand and, and to approach and deal with some of the violent crime trends. So uh, we are going to hear uh, from Marshall Clement, who's going to join us via Zoom. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, excellent. And then we have Nina Solomon, who's the Deputy Division Director for Corrections and Reentry. And uh, we have Madeline R. Dardo, the Deputy Program Director for the Council of State Government. So, uh, well, come on up um, and join us. I think this is an important uh, conversation for us to have because, as so we've heard from the Department of Juvenile Services, we've, um, you know, uh, the uh, GOCAP has given us numbers of tr crime trends as well, um, and that's accessible on their website. But this is an independent validator coming in. Uh, with you know no skin in the game, just giving us the pure analysis, and I think you know as we talk about uh, violent crime, but also juvenile crime in the state of Maryland, I always talk about trend lines, vice headlines. Um, trend lines require you to you know I think pay attention to what's what's working, and that'll uh, uh, inform our policy making process to make long term strategic decisions that are going to benefit our state in the long run. Um, and that the headlines are, are kind of the things that you should pay attention, but they're more short term. And so um, I think what we're going to see here is that, and this is the narrative that's been streaming through, you know, the entire conversation, even in the interim, is that overall violent crime trends are down. Um, and that's true in the adult and the juvenile system. Um, but there are significant spikes in certain areas. Mm -hmm. um, gun violence and car theft and carjackings, for instance, are, are spikes. And those are what the headlines are telling you. So you've got to pay attention to both the trend lines and headlines. But for our long-term decision-making, it's important to understand what those trend lines are. And so I think uh, this presentation will be revelatory in that regard. And so uh, really looking forward to what you all have to say. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Chair Smith, members of the committee, my name is Madeline Dardo with the Council of State Governments Justice Center, and I'm joined by my colleague Nina Solomon today. Um, we appreciate you having us this afternoon to talk about violent crime and accountability trends in Maryland. Uh, for those of you that we haven't had the pleasure of working with, the Justice Center is a national, nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. Um, we work with all three branches of government, and our primary focus is bringing data and research to you all as you develop strategies that increase public safety and strengthen communities. So part of our work does explicitly focus on improving uh, public safety and outcomes for youth in the juvenile justice system. So today I'm going to talk really specifically to um, adult violent crime trends and responses to adults who commit violence, and then I'm actually going to pass it over to my colleague Nina toward the end of the presentation to speak specifically to youth. So as we dive in, it's really important um, to set the backdrop of where we find ourselves in this particular moment. I probably don't have to tell you all, you're hearing from your constituents, you're seeing it in the headlines, um, but the public is concerned about crime and they distrust the justice system's ability to be able to handle um, what is a perceived rise in violence. Recent Gallup poll data shows that 70% or 78% of people think that there's more crime across the United States than in previous years. 40% of people are very dissatisfied with policies to control or reduce crime. And only about 17% of people report having a great deal or quite a lot of trust in the justice system. So we're going to talk about well, whether or not the data kind of bears out this public perception, but it's really important to start with this because these are conversations that really do impact the policy conversations that you will have here. So despite these increasing concerns about violent crime, far more people in the United States actually die due to alcohol and drug related deaths. Um, and this is the same in Maryland. So nationally in 2022, four times more people died of overdoses compared to homicide. And then in Maryland, you can see this steep increase here in fatal drug overdoses. That's gonna be that orange line as, com as compared to the green line, which is homicides. 
And in 2022, there were five and a half times more deaths due to fentanyl than in 2015. So what does the data tell us about whether violent crime is up or down? Um, one of the best measures that we have for the overall violent crime rate is the National Victimization Survey. So this is an annual survey where they ask folks, have they been a victim of a, of a crime? And so um, and we know that only about half of violent crime was actually reported to law enforcement. So this type of survey really gives us a broader understanding of what the scope of violence is in our communities. And so what you can see in this chart using that national victimization data is that from 1993 to 2022, there was actually a 70% decrease in the rate of violent victimization. This is significant, and this is, this is good news. Because while there's certainly work to do, and we're going to be talking about that in just a minute, um, it is very clear that we're kind of not at the scale, we're not at the at the point that we were 30 years ago when it comes to violence. However, despite this national drop in the overall violent crime rate, there are places, there are states across the country where violent crime has increased. So this chart right here shows the increase in the violent crime rate between 2019 and 2022. Uh, 32 states saw a decrease in violent crime, whereas 18 states saw an increase. Um, from 2019 to 2022, there were also um, significant and important variations by offense for violent crimes. Um, uh, aggravated assault and homicide both increased nationally, while rape and robbery decreased. Focusing specifically on Maryland now. So from 2012 to 2022, the overall violent crime rate in Maryland dropped 16%. There was a little bit of a spike. You can see that in 2021 in the orange line. But as of 2022, Maryland has gone, continued to come closer to the national average. Looking regionally, Maryland has the third highest crime rate in the Eastern region, so significantly behind DC and slightly behind New York. Nationally, Maryland has the 21st highest violent crime rate, so in the middle, about in the middle of the pack. So this presentation is gonna be primarily focused on violent crime, as I've discussed, um, but we wanted to give you kind of the larger picture of crime generally in Maryland. So this slide shows you the overall property crime rate, um, which has declined 41% in the last decade and is now below the national average. This has been driven by a 67% decrease in burglary, a 36% decrease in larceny, and a 13% decrease in motor vehicle theft. So both violent crime and property crime have trended downward in the state of Maryland over the last decade. So unsurprisingly, there are variations in violent crime by county across the state of Maryland. Um, from 2019 to 2022, um, violent crime either stayed the same or decreased in a little less than two thirds of Maryland counties. So if you look at this uh, map here, the states that are leaning closer to the gray is where violent or the counties that are leaning closer to the gray is where violent crime decreased. And where they're leaning closer to the red is where violent crime increased. Only about a third of uh, Maryland counties saw an increase in violent crime in the past three years. So the violent crime rate is actually made up of four offenses. So that's homicide, aggravated assault, rape, and robbery. And um, the highest volume offense is by far aggravated assault. And that really is what drives those trend lines that we've been looking at so far. So that's why it's really important when you're trying to understand a state's violent crime rate is that you break that down and actually look at that by offense. And when we do that in Maryland, what we realize is that decline in Maryland's violent crime rate that we talked about it's primarily driven by decreases in aggravated assault and robbery. Aggravated assault has decreased about 11% in the past 10 years. This is actually against the national trend where we see most states increasing. Um, and then robbery has declined a uh, significant 34%. This is more in line with what we see nationally uh, where robbery has really continued to steeply decline in the past decade. On the other hand, though, um, there's been increases in homicide and rape in Maryland in the last 10 years. Homicide has increased 35% and has consistently trended above the national average. 
whereas rape has increased 46% and has and is consistently trending below the national average. So we can break down the homicide rate just a little bit further. Um, this chart here shows the five Maryland law enforcement agencies with the highest homicide rates in 2022. Probably unsurprising to you all, the Baltimore Police Department is at the top of this chart, um, but you also see a few small or suburban um, jurisdictions. And one reason to note this is important is that smaller departments often face unique challenges when addressing increases in violent crime that can get lost in the conversations when we talk about urban areas, particularly if they're seen spikes as well. And so when you're thinking about a violent crime approach and supporting departments as they're addressing violent crime, um, this might look different in urban areas than rural areas. And so it's important to think about that comprehensive approach that takes into account the needs of, um, of and the challenges that these different departments might face. So regardless of the fluctuations in the violent crime rate over time, um, the national, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped ahead. Um, it's it's also important to note, so as we're thinking about, um, as we're thinking about homicide and violent crime rates, there are significant racial disparities. So we don't have Maryland specific data here. Um, we do have that data for other states. We're just not able to get it for you all. Um, however, I will note that in most of the other states where we have this data, it trends along with this, this um, national trend line where so the national homicide rate of black victims has consistently been higher than the rate of white victims, but this disparity has grown really significantly. And you can see that start um, steep increase from 2019 to 2021. Now we get to it. Um, so despite these fluctuations in violent crime rates and homicide rates as we've been talking about, then nationally, that percentage of violent crimes that are reported to police but are not solved. And by not solved, we mean that someone's not been identified, arrested, or referred to prose for prosecution for that incident has actually increased over the last 10 years. So this data is collected um, by law enforcement agencies and it's reported to the FBI annually. And so in 2022, 77% of robberies were not solved. There was no arrest in 74% of rapes, 59% of aggravated assaults, and a little bit less than half of all homicides. And these rates have actually increased over time, which means this challenge has actually been getting greater, right? So from 20, 2012 to 2022, there's been a 10% increase in the unsolved, the number of crimes that are not solved by law enforcement for homicide, a 14% increase for aggravated assault, 14% increase for rape, and a 5% increase for robbery. So focusing specifically on Maryland. In Maryland, 64% of violent crimes reported to police were not solved in 2022. Again, that means there was no arrest made. So this is about two points um, higher than the national average. And all violent crimes in Maryland are more likely to go unsolved today than a decade ago. So in 2022, the percentage of unsolved crimes, 66% um, of homicides, there was no arrest, 57% of aggravated assaults, 70% of rapes, and 75% of robberies. And again, all of these have increased over the past 10 years. And so breaking this down a little further, um, from 2019 to 2022, the percentage of violent crimes that went unsolved increased in over half of Maryland counties. So again, you're thinking about the, the um, on this map, this, the counties that are going more toward the gray is where those unsolved rates decreased, and the counties where you're going toward the red is where unsolved rates increased, where less violent crime was getting solved over the past three years. Can I ask? Yes, sir. Are you not including Baltimore's data in this? We are. So your your picture shows that Baltimore's violent crimes uh, or un, that went unsolved is down like almost 100 percent by that depiction. Because I would have a, I would love to see that data because mm -hmm. I don't see. That. Yes, sir. I can double check that for you with our analysts. Yes, Absolutely. <laughs> 
And so nationally, there are also increases um, in disparities between who receives justice when, they're har when there's harm. So the homicides of black victims are about twice as likely to go unsolved as homicides of white victims. This has been the trend um, since the mid, um, excuse me, the mid eighties, but there's been a widening in that disparity over the last several decades. So what do unsolved rates tell us about our violent crime strategy, right? So what are those, um, you know, this is an important measure, um, often overlooked, but what does it tell us about how our public safety system is functioning? So if you've got on the left here, you have all violent crime, right? We know about half of that is violent crime that's reported to police. We know less than that, right? Leave about a little, this would be about 36% here in Maryland, there's actually an arrest for that violent crime. And then a smaller number of those folks, those are people on supervision or are incarcerated for a violent offense. And then even smaller than that, an estimated one in 10 arrest for violent crime are people that are on supervision. And so what this tells us is that if we're thinking about focusing all the way to the left on prevention or all the way to the right on this chart on punishment, that there's actually also a place in the middle, right? There's a place where we're think there's an opportunity to think about increasing accountability and also responding more effectively to the people who commit violent crime. And so I probably don't have to tell you all this, but failing to solve violent crime leads to less safety, right? That's, this is, these are the, these are, this is one reason why it's important, less safety for victims and communities, more risk of retaliatory violence, less justice when folks have been harmed, less deterrence for the criminal justice system as a whole, and less trust in the justice system's ability to protect and respond. Research is also clear um, that it's the certainty of punishment, not necessarily the severity of punishment, which is what deters crime. So people's choices and behavior are influenced more by the likelihood of getting caught than they are necessarily by how severe the punishment would be if and when they do, right? So another way to think about this is that if you are, you know, somebody's driving down the road, right? Are they more likely to th um, think about not speeding if you re if the recently the penalty has doubled or if they know that there's probably a law enforcement um, the law enforcement behind a tree up there that's going to pull them over if they go past speeding? For most of us, it's going to be the likelihood of getting pulled over. And so what that means for you all as policymakers, how to kind of translate that is that investing in increasing accountability and closing that gap, right, and holding more people accountable for violent crime can actually do more to reduce crime than investing in increasing punishment. Um, and investing in effective evidence-based law enforcement practices that build community trust versus those longer incarceration terms, more significant sentences and penalties for that minority of people that are getting apprehended right now. <laughs> And the good news is that this is possible. Um, solving more violent crime is possible. So we've got three examples here from jurisdictions that have focused resources and time and training and funding to be able to solve more violent crime and have had significant results. Um, Boston boosted its homicide solve rate from 47 to 66%. Um, Denver created a special unit to solve non-fatal shootings, um, applying the same level of effort and resource they, that they were applying to solving um, homicides. And within seven months, they were able to increase their solve rates from 39% to 65%. Um, Omaha adopted a comprehensive community-driven violence reduction effort, and their solve rate for homicides went from 32% in 2010 to 100% in 2023. And while these efforts are happening at the local level, um, states can do a lot to support these localities in solving more violent crime with targeted support and assistance. Um, they can provide data and expertise so they can help identify those places that have low solve rates and provide training and technical assistance to help local agencies. Uh, they can provide funding um, to support wi victims and witnesses of violent crime to invest in building community relationships and trust to increase cooperation with investigations. And they can help reduce backlogs and delays at, at um, state crime labs to processing evidence and also thinking about reducing caseloads for detectives. And so we just talked about capacity. And so what is the capacity of Maryland law enforcement to address violent crime? 
Um, this is a 10,000 foot view. Um, what you see on the left are Maryland police officers and detectives employed per 100,000 residents. And then on the right, Maryland police officers and detectives per violent crime. Um, both of these are trending downward and both of them are currently below the national average. Um, we are, again, limited 10,000 foot view, um, but research does indicate that when you're talking about solving violent crime, it's not necessarily more law enforcement equals more solved offenses. It's more um, targeted, specific law enforcement resources and staff dedicated to solving violent crime. However, we know that we, um, our public safety agencies are really experiencing incredible shortages right now, staffing shortages, um, and law enforcement is no exception. And so when a, there is a staffing shortage at an agency, they're less likely to be able to devote those resources. And so there are a couple of good examples of states that are, um, are supporting local law enforcement to solve violent crime. Um, in 2023, New York launched an initiative really focused on non-fatal shootings and preventing retaliatory gun violence. This program was launched after a um, multi kind of jurisdictional demonstration site period where there were, there were um, sites that had as low as 14% uh, um, solve rates for homicide that were able to see those increase by the by the double digits. And then Arkansas recently established a violent crime clearance rates um, grant fund, again, really thinking about how you use data to target um, where resources need to go, and then providing those really specific targeted resources for law enforcement to solve more violent crime. And so we've, we've spent a lot of time really talking about this first um, way to reduce, states can reduce violent crime. That's solve more violent crimes to increase accountability and deter future violence. Um, states can also make data-driven investments in violence prevention. They can use data to be able to target resources where they're most needed. Um, they can invest in programs that are proven, that are evidence-based, and they can build in evaluation into promising practices in order to be able to develop those particular, um, those particular practices. Address trauma to prevent trauma. Being able, making sure that we're, we're supporting victims, we're supporting witnesses to crime, supporting communities, and supporting law enforcement and the people who are working in those communities who are dealing with um, violent crime every day. Commit to a statewide recidivism reduction goal. Um, so while nationally recidivism rates have continued, have declined for people who are leaving, um, leaving prison, we still have a ways to go. There's still a lot more that we can do to be able to support um, successful reentry and reduce the likelihood that someone's going to reoffend. And then lastly, safety and justice deserve better data. Um, we, it is imperative that we collect, we report, we analyze um, the data at a level that is required in order to meet the challenges that are facing us and the challenges that are facing our communities. And so I'm going to turn it over to Nina. But Senator, I'm also during that time going to going to check on your question because that should that just to make sure that I've got the right information for you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Chair, members of the committee for having me as well. Um, I'm not going to use slides. I'm not presenting data in the way that Madeline was able to on the juvenile side. I'm not able to do that today. Um, but I did want to talk a little bit about youth crime um, more broadly, nationally, and the trends that we're seeing and how uh, the concerns that we're seeing here in Maryland are kind of mirrored across the country, and then talk about kind of some of the opportunities to address uh, youth crime, youth violence, um, and how they are, what is aligned with uh, what the research actually shows works to improve youth outcomes and strengthen public safety. Um, so as Madeline mentioned, as part of our work at the Justice Center, we focus on improving outcomes for young people and their families in the juvenile justice system. And we work with states and policymakers around the country to help them adopt research-based policies and practices to improve outcomes for young people. 
Um, I want to start by saying that the challenges that Maryland is facing right now with the juvenile justice system is consistent with what we're seeing in states around the country. Um, and I'm going to outline kind of three key things that we're seeing around the country in terms of juvenile justice trends. Um, one is the rising concern in many states on increasing youth violence and increasing youth crime, particularly around gun violence. Uh, we are seeing policymakers around the country facing pressure to quickly address these public safety concerns, suppress youth violence, respond to high profile incidents, and also the increased uh, media stories or attention on youth violence and youth crime. At the same time, we are also seeing a staff hiring and retention crisis that we haven't seen in many, many decades in the juvenile justice system, not just in our facilities or in law enforcement, um, but also with our community-based service providers and treatment providers that work directly with young people in the juvenile justice system. Um, this staffing crisis often leads uh, state and local agencies to focus on quick reactionary fixes rather than thinking about long-term systemic solutions. It's making an impact on wait lists for services and the types of services that young people can have access to while they're on supervision or in the juvenile justice system in the community. And then the third big trend um, is that states have large gaps um, in the types of services that are available and in the quality of services. The number of providers have been shrinking along with the staff shortages that work with youth across the juvenile justice continuum. And in particularly, we're seeing this with a lack of behavioral health services for young people in states around the country. This comes at a time when we're seeing uh, increasing and more intensive behavioral health needs with our adolescent population. We've seen a lot of data uh, more recently from the CDC and other data sources that there's been a dramatic rise in mental health issues for young people in loneliness, teen anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, particularly post pandemic. And given the lack of actual dedicated and funded resources for adolescent behavioral health systems in most jurisdictions, the juvenile justice system is increasingly becoming the default service system for all young people that have these particular needs. So states are experiencing these three big challenges. It's really important to not be reactionary, but really take a step back and respond with data-driven research-based solutions. We're seeing jurisdictions turning to strategies like more detention, more incarceration, harsher, harsher sanctions, or longer probation terms um, because there's frustration or there's a misunderstanding of what works to improve youth outcomes, or in some cases it's politically expedient. But we know from years and years of research on what works in juvenile justice to improve outcomes for young people that these things do not improve public safety and actually can make it worse. I'm not minimizing the concerns that we have around violent crime and juvenile violent crime. I live in Maryland. I see the news. Um, I talk to folks in my community, and I know this is a real concern for many people. Um, but I also want to say that uh, the population of young people that are committing these violent crimes um, or are repeat uh, offenders of these types of crimes um, they're harder to serve. They have higher and more complex needs. And we need to figure out what is the right array of services and responses that actually work um, to address these concerns. I also want to remind everyone that we're still talking about a really small population of young people committing violent offenses when we're comparing it to the larger population of young people involved in the juvenile justice system. And that's not just here in Maryland, but that's nationally. Um, nationally, historically, about seven or eight percent of young people in the juvenile justice system are there for violent offenses. The overwhelming majority of kids in the system are committing nonviolent offenses. Um, and it's, it's really imperative to not make blanket policies that can then negatively impact this over um, or this larger population of young people. Um, and what we're seeing in the media and the current narrative, there's a risk that these, these uh, kids that are not committing violent offenses, that are low risk kids, they could get swept up in these broad concerns around violent crime and ultimately end up further in the juvenile justice system and have their outcomes negatively impacted. I also want to say that Maryland has really robust data that you all here really have access to good and transparent data compared to a lot of states around the country. Um, we go into a lot of states to analyze juvenile justice data, and there are many states that can't answer foundational questions, basic questions about 
who's coming into their system and how they're moving through their juvenile justice systems. And so the data resource guide, all of the reports that are produced here by DJS are, are really robust. And the data trends that they're sharing are really similar to what we're seeing in the states that we're working in around the country and nationally. And that is that the overwhelming majority of young people that are arrested or referred are for nonviolent offenses, that we've seen a short blip or increase um, in the last few years post-pandemic, but really in certain violent offenses. And to Madeline's point, it's really important to look at and disaggregate the data by offense type um, to see where those blips are, are occurring. Um, but they're still overall way down, um, as the chairman mentioned in his opening remarks, when you compare them to pre-pandemic levels or when you look back even further back to the 90s or, or early 2000s. Um, and I also want to say that the increases really shouldn't be or can't be attributed to the juvenile justice reform law that was passed here a, a couple years ago. That law that was signed really mirrors what a lot of states have been doing in the last several years in terms of reforming their juvenile justice systems. Um, and that's really focusing on the low risk kids and getting those kids out of the juvenile justice system. We know that putting low risk kids in the system actually worsens their outcomes, worsens their mental health um, and, and other um, educational outcomes, et cetera. Um, and we know that diverting low risk kids is an effective public safety strategy. It also helps the state and the juvenile justice system prioritize their limited resources on those kids that are committing violent offenses or are a more uh, public safety risk. Um, and we know from other states that have passed similar reforms prior to Maryland in terms of increasing diversion for younger kids or low risk kids, that those reforms did not translate in an increase in crime or worse public safety in those states. Um, and we do know what works. There's been a lot of research in terms of what works to improve outcomes for kids um, and more juvenile justice involvement, more detention, more incarceration does not. But if you really want to increase public safety, use tax dollars more effectively, then states need to invest in an adolescent behavioral health infrastructure um, that includes crisis response systems, um, a continuum of community-based options to provide a range of services for young people in the community closer to home, approaches like cognitive behavioral therapy that are trauma-informed, community-centered, services that are more treatment oriented and that can provide services to young people, intensive behavioral health services to young people in a shorter duration of time. It's also critical to look at partnerships and develop partnerships across youth serving system. It shouldn't just be the juvenile justice system doing it alone and also partnering with local communities to create alternative responses to the juvenile justice system for youth that are low risk so that the juvenile justice system doesn't become the dumping ground. Um, but also uh, an alternative system to get kids access to services that might need them. Um, and then lastly, also investing in what works uh, or what we know works to address youth violence, investing in credible messenger, violence interruption, restorative justice, and other grassroots initiatives. We are really excited to learn more about the Thrive Initiative. I know the governor signed an executive order establishing a new office of children's services to address uh, a range of needs that kids might have in the state of Maryland. Um, and, and they'll focus on a lot of these different types of services. So really increasing the investment in the community. Um, it's also critical, um, and, and Madeline mentioned this on the adult side, to note that youth involved in violence are often vi victims of violence themselves, yet oftentimes we don't address youth victimization, um, the mental health or the trauma that they experience as a result of being a victim of violent crime. And so we need the full array of services and partnerships in the community uh, to be able to address them. Um, I will say um, before I end that while we don't have this data nationally right now uh, on the juvenile side, we're working on it. There's a lot more gaps in terms of law enforcement data that feeds into national data, data sets from the juvenile side. But we are working on analyzing data for kids or, or uh individuals under the age of 18, and we're going to make that data available nationally as well as kind of state by state data as well, probably this spring. So I would love to be able to brief you all on that when that's available, but thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much for that comprehensive deep dive. Uh, we have a couple questions. I'm going to go with uh, Senator Charles, and we have Senator Folden, and Senator, actually Senator Muse was first. My, my apologies. Senator Muse, Charles Folden, Senator. Thank you very much, Chairman, and uh, welcome. 
just a couple of our questions. One, you made mention that in 1993 until now, 70 percent has been a 70 percent drop in violent crimes. Just something to, to think about. Other than what you put in here, are there other things that would would uh, attribute to that that we need to know about and that we can do something about? Then, secondly, in the unsolved number of crimes and that increased, I have my own ideas. But any idea uh, why or what causes um, this unresolved uh, crime hike in? poor neighborhoods or black neighborhoods, et cetera. And if they have, and is it that these neighborhoods have less resources poured into them? Is, are there other reasons for that? Because in, as I think, if there are uh, less resources poured into those neighborhoods where the unsolved crime rate uh, is up, then that could attribute very much to why. If you're not solving them, then you've got more on the streets, et cetera. And if that is the case, what else can we do in terms of resources? Um, and, and are there other reasons other than what I brought up? Well, you're you're asking the million dollar questions there, right? Um, and the things that we actually need to spend more time and re resource to understand more about. Um, I think, you know, we... When you look at fluctuations in violent crime rates, you look at fluctuations in unsolved rates, things don't necessarily line up perfectly. And these things are really complicated. There's a lot of factors that go into why we're seeing the variations that we're seeing, um, not just over time, but across the country and across communities. Um, we do think a good place to start is thinking about some of those ways to reduce crime that we have here that have research and data and examples behind them. Like as you're talking about, you know, thinking about um, where we need to invest more resource, both on the law enforcement side and in communities as well, to be able to solve more of these violent crimes. Um, and other, you know, research supported strategies um, that we that we do know have worked over the past um, over, over the past decades to be able to contribute to that um, decline. But it's finding that silver bullet's really hard, right? Because these are really complicated and complex issues. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, I was looking at the presentation and uh, I was on slide 14 mm -hmm. and it was very descriptive in terms of the the national uh, rates when it comes to black victims and white victims. Do we have any data that's very uh, descriptive? Is it black on black? Is it white on black? Is it uh, white on white? Is it Asian on white? Is it Asian on black? It's just very, very descriptive. And I uh, like to see some of those numbers broken out too when it comes down. Uh, it's hard to, you know, come up with an answer when you're looking at the unsolved uh, situations. But when you look at 70% of the rapes that are unsolved, that leaves 30% of the rapes that were solved. What is it a bunch of black folks raping folks? Is it white folks raping people? Is it Asian folks? What, what is it? What do those numbers truly look like? Uh, so we could address those issues and the communities that that's coming from. And then same thing with the robberies, same thing with the 25% uh, of the robberies that have been solved. Is that coming from certain communities versus other communities? Uh, when you look at the, uh, what was this, the homicides, I think it's about 34% of the homicides that were solved. Is that, you know, what, how does that all come together mm -hmm. so we can get a better understanding? I think it was a little descriptive on just from a national average perspective that uh, you mm -hmm. see more black victims, but I'd like to get an overarching view from a statewide perspective. Absolutely, those are good questions. And we actually just recently did, um, and I can share this with the committee, <laughs> Uh, 50 state data snapshots that cover some of the information I talked about today, but also other really important data points across the justice system. We broke down in those data snapshots a little bit what you're talking about, those demographics behind this information. So I can share that with you all and make sure that also um, I know uh, that I'm not sure whether or not it includes some of the property information that you mentioned, but certainly the violent crime information, we can we can get that for you. I would love to see it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I appreciate y'all bringing this information forward. This is very enlightening. Um, I think we 
are all here trying to problem solve together. So that's important for all of us to share in the solution. Um, I do have some questions though about like your numbers. Yes, like I see that you have on slide 14, the one before uh, that Senator Charles mentioned, and it talks about Baltimore Police Department had 287 homicides in 2022, but this is the first year they've been under 300, which was 2023 mm -hmm. in some time. So I don't know that I, I have some questions about some of the data there. Sure, absolutely. And so we do have a team of analysts that put together this data for us. Um, and what we can do is I can I can definitely either take your questions and get back with you or we can sit yeah, down with them as well. That'd be great. I mean, I and just, make sure that we understand because absolutely there's it's complicated um, and there could be as we're there could be some. Um, Baltimore did not drop below 300 homicides until this past year in mm -hmm. some time. Mm -hmm. In fairness, I mean, that's sure. all involved. Sure. Um, but the, the numbers are important. And the one yes, thing, sir. speaking about the numbers is, is that when we talk about, um, you know, like what Senator Charles was talking about, when the victim data is factual, it's hard data, it doesn't change, it doesn't have a bias, it is what it is. And so even if we remove out some of the suspect data, because the state has different reporting measures, right, that we use metrics where we'll say, okay, here's a, a, a an assault or here's a, a homicide or here's a shooting that occurred. Here's the victim. Here's their sex, their race. You know, their, were they, did they have a gang affiliation? Did they not? They'll have all these things, these metrics marked out. Mm -hmm. For the arrestee, if there is an arrestee, it's still such a subjective standard at that point because it hasn't been prosecuted, right? They're still entitled to due process and law. But the victim data doesn't change. It is factual. And I think that if we look at that through a holistic approach of seeing that is the trend, that is the asthma that we've really got to look at because of where they're being shot where and, and the demographics associated with it. Um, the The... The presentation, when I was talking about the data for Baltimore, mm -hmm. I looked back at it, and now I see your data snapshot is 2019, 2022. In fairness, it's not really your best snapshot of window of time, because 2020 to 2022, we were basically under COVID mandates. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I appreciate the idea, mm -hmm. but when we're looking at something that's so important as this, I would like to see the data without a time where we had places completely shut down mm -hmm. and people weren't really even out of their houses in the community. Mm -hmm. um, when we saw the 1993 to 2022, that slide, where you talked about the decrease in violent victimizations, I mean, that comes right on the heels of that federal policing act where they hired mm -hmm. an extra couple hundred thousand that our current president was a big advocate for um, in supporting the hiring of more law enforcement, training of them, having them embedded in schools. So I think it's interesting to see that during that five-year window of time, 1993 to 1998, is when they did the massive part of that hiring from that that national, that federal legislation. Mm -hmm. You can see, watch that trend on that graph. It drops significantly down to 2000, and then it almost flat lines out for a good, a little bit of fluctuation. But there's a, there's there's got, there is a correlation there, in my opinion. Um, from what we're seeing with that data. And then I wanted to also, you know, your data supports what Dr. Scalia brought here the other day. And I think it's important to point out again, even at the reduced number of homicides in 2022 that you show at 287, you're showing per capita a 50.3 homicide rate per 100,000 mm -hmm. in Baltimore City, right? If we extrapolate that out, and we put that same measure, those same numbering matrix, if you will, into like Chicago's homicide rate, they would have 1,358 homicides mm -hmm. in Chicago to stay consistent with Baltimore solely. Mm -hmm. Not all of Maryland, just the city of Baltimore. That makes where we are. That's why the numbers are kind of concerning when you're showing the gray area of a reduction, but we have such a significant rate mm -hmm. of homicides and young, young homicide victims um, in in parts of our state. Um, so I would, I, I just would like to see if you could update the 2022. Um, mm -hmm. 
And then again, you know, slide 26, decrease in police per 100,000 residents. If you look at the line on that, it drops straight off from 2020 down to current staff. And it's still continuing. I'm sure that has continued beyond in 2023. Um, I know law enforcement is scrambling to try to meet their their staffing numbers. Mm -hmm. Baltimore police just put out their overtime pay rate where it was significantly, significant amounts of overtime to officers because of staffing issues is a major contributor to that. Mm -hmm. But when we're looking at the national average and standard that is accepted by the DOJ is like 2.4 mm -hmm. per 100,000 officers. Per, per 2.4 officers per 100,000 residents is the recommendation by DOJ standards. Mm -hmm. And Maryland is at 2.1 and in danger of slipping even below that. So I just think these are they're great presentations. Mm -hmm. I appreciate all the data you brought forward. It's just something for discussion here to understand that we are, get, we are losing officers at an alarming rate and we are seeing violent crime spiking, mm -hmm. at an, especially involving our kids, at an alarming rate as well. Mm -hmm. So thank you. No, thank you for that. And I, and I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think these are the types of things that folks need to wrestle with and they need to wrestle with it by looking at the data. Right. So I'm, I'm more than happy. And I think we should continue this conversation and make sure one, we want to make sure we get it right. You know, that's important to us. And so, um, you know, we, we do, um, we do work really hard to make sure that our data is as accurate as possible. And so I look forward to having more of those conversations with you, but I also fully support the fact that, you know, this is the starting point, right? Like this is the information that you all need to then to be able to question and tease apart and dive a little bit deeper. We're only right here, folks, right? There's so much more underneath that to go. And, and, and as I said before, these are complicated, complex issues. So I just appreciate, you know, you, you know, paying attention and really diving into that with us. Cause I think that's how we make progress, um, on these issues. Thank you. And good afternoon. Um, on slide 17, it says in Maryland, 64% of violent crimes reported to police were not solved. Uh, could you tell me the how violent crime? What what what's included in violent crime? Sure. So the the overall violent crime rate is made up of homicide, aggravated assault, robbery, and rape. All right, those four. All right. Um, with the research that you've done, I mean, I, I'm I'm curious um, because on the next slide. 18, um, it says 60-60% homicides unsolved, 57% aggravated assaults unsolved, 70% rape, 75 robbery. Um, I was just having this conversation with our chairman the other day, um, and I told him that I asked our police chief uh, if there's a question of if, if maybe we put too much on police. Um uh, and I know I think your uh, slide that deals with capacity must is talking about the number of people who are law enforcement officers, but God knows how many laws we pass every session criminalizing something and then saying police handle it. Um, so what I had mentioned to the, the question I had for the chairman was I, I wonder what the clearance rate for these types of crimes are across the state. Because as, as you point, I mean, if they're unsolved, it's, I, I guess our clearance rates aren't very good. But as you noted, if there, if there are certain consequences and you know that there's going to be accountability, that reduces crime. And I think in looking at these slides, I, I felt like I had this aha moment as to why the public feels as it does, because the crimes are happening and things aren't getting solved. So the question I have for you all, you had a list of different strategies as, I mean, as some of the different states and I guess other police departments are are using to help uh, focus uh, resources. But what I'm curious about uh, is have governments looked has your research shown where governments are looking to take things off of the plates of law enforcement? Mm -hmm. By way of example, um, in my district, I've recently seen uh, a good number of people 
uh, soliciting uh, hom homelessness and solicitation on the street. So I reached out to our county and they have they have service providers who will go out during the day. They don't go out in the evening. They say call the police. Like, I'm not going to call the police on a homeless person. I mean, is that the best of use of resources for law enforcement to be dealing with homelessness? So it's, it's that kind of thing what I'm and I was telling the chairman, I was just thinking if they if maybe we should be reimagining Again, what are we putting on the place of law enforcement? Does your research kind of go into anything like that? Mm -hmm. This that, that reminds me a lot of a conversation that we have in the in the realm of behavioral health a lot, right? Is law enforcement kind of stepping into gaps um, for behavioral health service providers when they don't things don't necessarily exist and dealing with behavioral health challenges that maybe they're not trained for or it's their job for, right? So I think you know there's an opportunity there, right? If we know that. Um, law enforcement needs to be able to devote specialized resources and specialized staff to solve more violent crimes. And then how do you get there? Right. Like it, it, it is a comprehensive issue of figuring out everything that's on our plate. And we've talked about staffing shortages and not having a resource and what that means to those conversations. Um, so stepping back and being able to really think about, you know, where where are resources going and, and what do they have the capacity to be able to do and not do and, and focus and not focus on um, is, is a good question to be able to get at. Um, to be able I, to get I, it, what's available. Right. I mean, I, I want my police officers to hold people accountable who are killing people and raping people. I mean, those, those types of that's what I want. I could care less that they're out there trying to get the homeless. people. I, I don't want that. But I again, I, I don't know if the, you, you say this stuff. But again, I, I don't like suggesting things unless I know things. You got some research and and and, and I'm not liking this issue had been looked at because it's that serious. Mm -hmm. um, th thank you. We take another question. I wonder, is Mr. Clement, uh, did he, is he, does he have a presentation or is he just standing by for questions? He's just standing by for questions. Excellent. Yes, okay. Thank you. Great. Uh, Senator Walsh-Rager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you both for coming here today. I really appreciate it. This was um, illuminating and the, and the hard data is really appreciated. Um, I kind of want to just um Explore a little more what you started with, which is the dissonance between public perception and the statistics that you pre um, presented and try to get at some of the nuance inherent in that. So um, as the Senator from Frederick pointed out, it looks like your statistics are based on a per 100,000 people model. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, it struck me that that, um, that that might not be how people perceive crime. In other words, if, mm -hmm. if I'm in a jurisdiction in the year 2000 with 100,000 people and 10 murders, and then I'm in a jurisdiction in that same jurisdiction 20 years later, and it has 119 murders, but 20% more people, 120,000 people, your data would show that the homicide rate per 100,000 had gone down, even though the number of homicides mm -hmm. had gone up 19%. Is that an accurate description? Yeah, I mean, I think what you're getting at about the difference between how people feel and then what they perceive in their communities is actually even greater than that, right? Like, I mean, it's it depends on when we're a lot of times when we're talking about the data that we just showed, we're talking about across the state. This is going to feel differently, and those rates may appear differently community by community, right? And then even within those communities, and really when you get granular and you start thinking about, do I have the information I need to target the resources that I want to target? Are there particular streets? And I think somebody already mentioned this um, today in our conversation. Are there streets? Are there neighborhoods? Um, we did some work in Oklahoma several years ago where they really got that granular and they focused their resources on neighborhoods. Um, and and that, I think that's what, you know, when you're thinking about there's the perception and there's the reality, that's a piece of it, right? Is that we can talk about the data up here, but how people are feeling about what they're seeing on the news or maybe what they're even seeing in their communities, depending on where they are, can feel different. Right. But I guess my point is, is, is that two things can be true at the same time. In mm -hmm. other words, I think it's, it, I think it's facile to boil this down to kind of people are receiving information from their neighbors and the news that is inaccurate relative to the, to the statistics. Mm -hmm. If, if there are 19 more murders in a community, but 20% more people in the community, the per capita number would go down, mm -hmm. even as the absolute number would go up. Mm -hmm. And people's perception of the absolute number may be driving their feeling about the rise in crime. And both things are true, mm -hmm. right? The per capita number is lower, as you've indicated, but the absolute number is higher. 
and people might be measuring something different than you're measuring. Mm -hmm. That's all. Thank you. Which is why the Chicago Vice Baltimore City, you know, model is so compelling because the population differences tend to and the growth trends. Uh, Senator West. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the the slides are fascinating and very illuminating. Um, I want to just focus on five of them, which I think collectively tell a story. So slide 18 talks about uh, 75 percent of robberies in 20, 2022 went unsolved. Two thirds of homicides went unsolved. Went, and lots of other ones. 70 percent of rapes went unsolved. A huge percentage of unsolved crimes. Then I move over to send it to slide 23. And if I can get there, it says, um, gosh, I've gone too far. <laughs> uh, research is clear that the certainty, not the severity of punishment is what deters crime. So clearly there's no certainty when two thirds of homicides aren't solved and 70% of rapes aren't solved and 75% of robberies aren't solved. There is no certainty. People are committing crimes and getting away with, literally getting away with murder in some cases because the crimes aren't being solved. Um, and the public I see sees that, I, bl I believe sees this. Then we go to slide 24. With focus and resources, police are solving more violent crime. What we need is resources to solve these crimes and to bring more certainty. Then I go two slides back to slide 26, um, which is, what's the capacity of Maryland law enforcement to address violent crime? And you have some fascinating graphs on that page showing that between 2011 and 2021, the, the number of police officers employed per 100,000 residents in the U.S. was basically static. But in Maryland, it's gone dramatically downwards. Mm -hmm. And then finally, slide 28, five ways states can reduce violent crime. Your number one way is number one, solve more violent crimes to increase increase accountability and deter future violence. My takeaway from all this is our police forces are simply not sufficient today because they've been declining for years to bring certainty to the equation because these crimes aren't being solved. Is that what you believe as well as the takeaway from your slides? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, what really hits home is, you know, the slide that um, I talked about where you have the big blue bar of all violent crime, where we talk about you can focus on prevention. And then you have on the other end, some of the smaller pieces where people who actually end up being held accountable, right? And it's closing that gap. That's 100% the message, right? Is that if we really want to get serious about deterring future violence, we have solving violent crime is a really going to be a big piece of that equation and making sure that folks are held accountable when they commit harm against another person. And let me just give you one final uh, factoid, and that is I understand that in Baltimore City, one out of every five police positions is vacant, and they're not able to fill these positions because there are not enough people applying to become police. Despite bonuses and all kinds of other inducements, they can't get people to apply to join the police force. Doesn't that say speak volumes about our the police's ability to solve these crimes? It's certainly a challenge, and it's not a challenge that's unique to you all here. I mean, it's something that we hear from folks, you know, across, honestly, public safety professions, including law enforcement across the country. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just want to make certain that I heard what I thought I heard earlier in the presentation, and I think it was prior to uh, my, my colleague being here. I thought that you had presented uh, that having well growing growing police forces wasn't necessarily the answer it was solving crime it, is it, am i am i accurate in what so i heard it's, it's nuanced right so what the research shows is that just increasing law enforcement officers doesn't necessarily just generally increasing the size of your force does not necessarily equate to more solving more violent crime it's increasing law enforcement officers that are specialized and focused on solving violent crime However, what we have to understand, right, is when we're dealing with capacity issues, these agencies are less likely to be able to have the resources to be able to be that focused, right? So it's it's kind of both it's a, it's kind of a both and there. So if we want to solve violent crime, we have to make sure that we are devoting resources to that. Um, but when there's a general shortage among departments, it can be harder for them 
to do that. And then, and then I would say that it will be our job then to make certain that those specialized units do what they're supposed to do, because in Baltimore City, we had the gun trace task force, which was fo focused and specialized, but went beyond. No, exactly. So yes, sir. That. thank you. Thank you. Resources are fungible in that, in that regard. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Uh, Senator James. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. I really got a lot out of the presentation, but of course, yeah, it, we're time limited and you try to give as much as you could. So I don't want to extend the hearing, but sort of following up on uh, my colleague, Senator West, I'm looking at the numbers of unsolved crimes in Maryland historically. Now, we only go back to 2012. I, I look at those numbers and think they are unacceptable, unacceptable. So that's 11, 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. So um, I would like to get some follow-up data. I can't average that out, but if the average is currently six, what was the number you gave us? 64. That just astonished me, me. I think the public would be rightfully disgusted if the average in 2012 was 40% or 45, if I'm quickly eyeballing this. That's just astonishing to me. Mm -hmm. So I would love to get some data on since this is a known problem and it's only gotten worse and even before law enforcement reform even before the terrible tragedy with george floyd all of the issues that have come up since and debates about morale with law enforcement versus accountability you know 2012 mm -hmm. this predates that and these numbers are bad so i would just like to follow up information about what's driving that and if you gave it to us nationally, which you probably did, um, mm -hmm. if you did, if you didn't, please do. So mm -hmm. I can sort of see that trend line. Um, and then, uh, so again, historically, I'd like the data and uh, maybe some more specifics mm -hmm. on what are the ideas. I know more money. I know more of this, mm -hmm. more, more, more. But I think there are, you know, mm -hmm. strategic targeted things you can do to address some of these numbers. So that's some follow-up information I'd appreciate. Sure. We're, we're happy to provide that. I know. I love data too. Yeah. So I appreciate you. Definitely do that. Um, I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's uh, again, million dollar questions, right? What's driving it? These things are complicated. Um, and I think what we can do is that, well, you know, again, there's no silver bullet to say it's exactly this thing we do have and what we can follow up with you on are those are those strategies that have that have worked in places that have had these challenges and they've been able to see progress. And then if I could just one fo follow up on uh, the presentation from uh, you about juvenile and you have to go up to the podium so we can see you. <laughs> um, I wrote down in my notes that um, I think nationally or Maryland or both. And maybe you could break that down for me. You, you sort of said these, the most violent juvenile cr criminals or repeat offenders hovers around seven or eight percent. And I, I'm not sure if that's. That's national data. National. Yes, so about I would, seven or eight percent. I'd like to know what that is in Maryland. Mm -hmm. And then I'd like to be accurate when I talk to people. So am I safe in saying both nationally and in Maryland, when you give me the other number, which is. You take out 8% from 100, you're 92%. Is, am I safe in saying the 92% other juvenile criminal defendants are nonviolent? And just to be careful about this, um, you know, low level crimes, if you will, right? Is that is that a fair assessment? And finally, it's again, I know you didn't have time to do data. I would like you were, you were right to say, let's target the particular crimes. So what I would like to see is sort of a breakdown of that 100%, what you're categorizing in the 7 or 8% to be violent, the rest of it. And I'd like that both nationally and for the state of Maryland. That'd be very helpful. Sure. Yes, we're definitely happy to provide that. On the national level, um, there is a, a census data that shows kind of hovers around seven or eight percent depending on the year um, in the last several years seven or eight percent of all young people 
that are referred to the juvenile justice system are referred for a violent offense. And I can get you the definition of what they categorize. And longitudinally, so and, I meant yes. to clarify that. If you could go back a decade yeah. or so, it's like uh -huh. pre-pandemic for sure. Yes. Yeah, that would be helpful. Yeah. And then you're right to say that the other 92, 93% are nonviolent. Um, and I can, I can show what that constitutes, but they're lower level, like misdemeanor, property, drug, like those types of offenses. Um, but I can get that the definition. Um, and I know that because um, I, I was reviewing uh, the Department of Juvenile Services data year by year and kind of it, it, it mirrors that. I know they've had a slight uptick um, in certain violent offenses in the last couple of years, but the data it, it's a, it hovers around right under 10% in, in most states that we look at, but I can look at DJS's data as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Chairman, just one, one, one more. I, I noticed when we, we talked uh, in your presentation about some of the causes and some of the uh, ways to bring crime down, mm -hmm. one, you said it was the certainty of an arrest as opposed to tougher sentences. So the certainty of arrest seems to bring crime down, if I'm hearing what you said, as opposed to just saying tough, tougher sentences, tougher sentences. And if that's the case, should our focus be on the more resources so that we can arrest those who need to be arrested rather than just the uh, sentencing from a legislative perspective? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Um, so it is it is the certainty of accountability, the certainty of getting caught that influences behavior over the, the length of the punishment or severity of the punishment um, if and when you are caught. Um, so that's that's what the research indicates. And that does indicate that, you know, for you all, especially as you're thinking about, you know, you have limited resource. There's not unlimited resource that you can just dole out to everyone. Right. So where are you going to get the biggest bang for your buck when you're talking about deterring crime? And so what that research does indicate is that if you are making investments and in increasing accountability, increasing the certainty um, that someone will that someone will be held accountable for their crime, that you will see, then see kind of the dividends in the um, reduction of future violence. Thank both of you for the uh, presentation and thank you. Thank you. We appreciate your time. I don't see any more questions. So thank you all very much. This has been extremely helpful. I mean, a lot of the lessons here are are not new necessarily, but you kind of have to hear this over and over again because some of the lessons are perishable and it's good for us to hear this, but also they're colored with the actual data points from Maryland. Um, so obviously, you know, fake focusing on deterrence, um, but also prevention and closing that gulf. Um the, the clearance rates, uh, I think, are, are are fairly shocking to anyone that has is looking at this afresh. And so, we obviously have some points of of failure that we can look at addressing. And we look forward to working with you in the future um, to help us, you know, make educated, sound, and wise decisions as we move through the session. So, I just want to say thank you very much for taking your time. Um, the information is on our web, on the MGA website, so anyone can go grab it. But this is very helpful for the members. So, thank you very much and. Um, we appreciate you. Yeah, thank you. We appreciate y'all having us and you, you'll have my contact information and you can re reach Nina or myself through there. We look forward to continuing the conversation. Excellent. Thanks. And for Senator James, anyone else who made a data request, we're going to memorialize that and send it in, in writing so that uh, we, we get the information distributed to the rest of the members. Very good. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you all very much.